Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the one-hour chart of silver provided by netdania.com. I've drawn in a couple of things here that I think are important. The first one, of course, is going to be this rising pennant. And it is important because it is still in a rising formation. We're going to watch tomorrow and see what happens. But the pattern so far has been a bottoming pattern. Now, the reason I've drawn in these lines here is to show you that uh, critical price is going to be this price here. If we look at this price here at about 1635, 1640, this is a price where if we get to that price, all of this volume is going to be below us. Now that's important. That's something we're going to look at when we look at the derivatives and how this is a derivative driven market. And also, we're going to look at some of the questions about derivatives, open interest, and how that works. But just to understand this view and why this is important, if we continue up in the sort of pattern that we've established here, if we get a move like this and come back into this area, then that's going to mean that all of this volume is below us. And however many of these contracts were new contracts that were opened on the long side. Now, you have to remember, and we're going to look at this further when we get to the questions, but you have to remember that for every open long, there's an open short. So every time someone initiates a long position, there's a short that takes the other side. When someone initiates a short position, there's a long that takes the other side. So. If the price rises with this massive volume and the open interest stays fairly steady, then what that information tells you is in this derivative-driven paper market, there have been a large number of longs that have entered in and are willing to not necessarily stand for delivery, but they're at least willing to roll over thinking that they may have picked a bottom. Now this is a very dangerous game to play. We know because when we look at the daily chart that the banks, the bullion banks, the Federal Reserve, and all the people who are behind this suppression have expended a tremendous amount of money to drive the price down to where it is. And based on that, there's no indication that they can't spend a lot more money to drive it even lower. Now at some point they're either going to run out of money or they're going to run out of will to keep doing that. When you have a, a derivative it has some type of feedback loop into reality. If you had a completely disconnected derivative and that's what I meant when I did my video about disconnecting starting and how there was a connection between the mint running out of silver eagles and this artificially low price of silver because there still is that connection between this derivative driven paper market and the real market because there still are physical sellers willing to sell at those prices. So when they drive the price down using derivatives, they have a risk. One risk is that they will drive the producers of the commodity out of business. Now, we know that a very important observation was made by uh, Jeff Nielsen of Bullion Bulls Canada, and I've emphasized that a number of times, and that is about whether a mine is a primary silver mine or not. Now, we know that the designation of a primary silver mine or primary gold mine or primary base metal mine has very little to do with the distribution of the metals. The distribution of the metals in these mines is fairly uniform across the board. Yes, there are mines like those ones in Idaho and in, in the 1800s, the ones in Nevada, that had a disproportionate amount of silver to gold or gold to base metals or base metals to the others. Those are varied depending upon the geological location of that particular mine. Nevertheless, if the price of one of those metals, whether it's gold or silver or the base metals, is driven down 
to a low enough level, then it no longer is a primary X mine. So as Jeff Nielsen pointed out, the number of primary silver mines has dropped dramatically. Now that doesn't have to do with the amount of silver in the mines. It has to do with the price of silver because it becomes more profitable to mine the other metals and therefore it becomes essentially a mine of that metal. Hopefully that makes it clear. We're going to get further into that when we look at some of these questions. I want to look at how this is a derivative driven market because we've had a lot of comments on the YouTube channel and a lot of people who are anti-silver people coming on and saying that I'm making this stuff up and I'm going to try to show you why that's not the case. So let's get to the questions that have come on to the member site. And we're going to make this a member update just because some of this is sensitive. Don't want to release it to the general public. So the first question is from Ozzy. Brother John F., why don't you ever recommend buying gold or stacking gold? Now, Jennifer addressed this a little bit, and definitely uh, there is the factor of the gold-silver ratio, which I don't know where it is right now. It's between 70 and 75. And we know, as Eric Sprott has pointed out, that they're pulling it out of the ground at roughly 10 to 1, which is a number that's been falling. We also know that dollar-for-dollar dollar buying is 10 to 1 or less uh, The as far as uh, the ounces. As far as the dollars, it's one to one. So people are spending just as much money on physical silver as they're spending on physical gold. So that's the first reason is because how undervalued silver is. Now, the other reason that's even more important than that is that due to the undervaluation of silver, the reclamation of silver isn't occurring. If you go into my office series, you'll see one of the videos, I don't remember which number it is in the series, but it's about the unmining of silver. And what's happening with silver is that it's being unmined. In other words, uh, the price of silver is so low that it's being discarded and not recycled. Gold, on the other hand, is recycled because its price is high enough for that to be a justifiable uh, price. So when silver is unmined, in other words, when silver is thrown into landfills with the electronic components that it's just not worth um, pulling it out, it's actually being distributed into the crust of the earth in a way that's less concentrated than it was when it was initially mined. That's why you still see a higher concentration on mining than you see on recycling because the price is so low. So those are the two reasons that I don't currently recommend stacking gold uh, because the gold that has been mined since the beginning of time, pretty much all of it is with us. The central banks have stockpiled it, individuals have stockpiled it, and recyclers have brought it back out and it's been stockpiled. We have almost all the gold in a held form, in a form where it can actually be melted down, made into bars, and delivered against these uh, paper derivative contracts. Silver, on the other hand, we're totally dependent on our yearly mining number, and that's why I cite that number so much. Now, yes, we have big numbers coming in for the Silver Eagles, I think, this year's probably going to be a record. We're going to be looking at that very important number of 50 million ounces. That's a very important number because that's the number that we pull out of the ground here in the U.S., in the continental U.S., and roughly the number that we're purchasing in physical. So it's about a one for one. We've talked about the fact how they redid the law about the fact that the, the metal for the Silver Eagles has to be sourced physically within the U.S. and the amount uh, minted is at the discretion of the Treasury Secretary. That's something that Bix Weir addressed. So they're, they're changing the laws on that. But the bottom line is this, that we get about 50 million ounces out of the ground every year here in the U.S. 
and we sell about 50 million ounces of the Silver Eagle. So we're at about a zero for the U.S. When the, the gold-silver ratio reverts back to anything like the realistic ratio we have, 10 to 1, where we're buying it or where it's being pulled out of the ground, then definitely I would recommend putting a percentage into gold. But right now, I would say personally, uh, my percentage is in, in the high 99s. But for everyone else, I'm not going to recommend what they do, but I would definitely say the heaviest weighting would be for silver. Next question is from Billy Brinks. He says, hello, AG Silver Bear. Do you know where I can find the video Dissecting Disingenuous Dawn? Now, I've done a number of videos in the past where I have done what I will term a counterattack. Now, I have not attacked anybody personally. Uh, a couple of the videos that have, have had to have been taken down because of threatened lawsuits were ones that had to do with Don Harold, ones that had to do with Bill Still, and some others. It's really not worth it for me to... I don't have the deep pockets to fight a lawsuit against somebody. It's much easier for me to just take the video down. So that's what happened with that video, and that's what happened with some other videos. We don't have a lot of YouTube revenues. It's not really important to us to fight a battle like that that we're not going to win anyway. So unfortunately, uh, those have been taken down, and that's one of the reasons why we created the member site. Uh, we're not subject to being sued for what we say. And again, I regret attacking anyone personally. It's really not my, um, it's not my right to decide what someone's motives are. Um, sometimes I've slipped into that when I have seen silver and silver stackers attacked. And again, it's only been a, a counter attack. I've never gone after somebody unless they've attacked myself, Chris Duane, Silver Doctors, SGT, or one of the other big silver, uh, physical silver stackers, I've only just counterattacked to show the motives of these people. But again, I've had to take those videos down because of threatened lawsuits. And the last question also from Billy Brinks is, recently I was arguing to a friend that the price was manipulated to stay down to help hide the weakness of fiat currencies but my friend then argued that the banks are only doing it because they found a way to make money on these bets. When I told them there is not money to be made because there was nobody buying these contracts, he replied, of course there is, otherwise there's not a contract. I didn't know how to counter that one, so I realized I do not understand it well enough to explain it to myself. The volume part of the charts confuse me. Do the spikes represent only absolute volumes, both selling and buying volumes? How do we know the spikes are selling? So there's a couple of questions here. The first one is that are the banks doing this just because they found a, a way to make money on these bets? Now. Obviously, the banks are going to do something they can make money on if the regulators don't stop them. It doesn't matter what it is. If the banks can rig any market, they're going to try to make money on that market. The question is not, why do banks make money on rigged markets? The question is, why are the markets rigged? Who is rigging those markets and who is not stopping those markets from being rigged? So the important takeaway is that gold and silver markets, and silver especially so, are markets that are critical to the power of the central banks. And because of this, the central it's my opinion the central banks themselves, starting with the BIS, have targeted physical silver and gold for manipulation, suppression specifically. Now, because the bullion banks and the Wall Street banks know that that is a position of 
the central banks to do that, there's no question they're going to front run those trades. They also front run stock trades. We know the statement, uh, I think it was Bullard, about coming out, propping up the stock market. There's no question that after that statement was made, they piled on and, and made a lot of money on, on paper stocks. So it's not that they're doing it just to make money. They're doing it because that's the order that's been given from the powers that be, and they know they can make money. Now, the next question is about there are two sides to a contract. That is absolutely true. I talked about that when I talked about this volume here. And you have to understand open interest. And I've explained this before in other videos. When open interest is rising, that means contracts are being initiated by a person who wants to open that contract. Now that could be a long contract, that could be a short contract. It means that someone's initiating, they're creating a contract. If longs are creating a large number of contracts, if this volume here was primarily instituted by longs taking a position and, in, and, and creating new contracts, and they're keeping those contracts open. In other words, through this volume spike, open interest is rising or staying the same. Then that tells you that the longs are willing to stand and try to pick a bottom here. Whereas if this volume is actually the shorts covering their shorts, in other words, they're extinguishing existing short contracts. That's why the volume's rising. They have massive shorts that they've had and they finally say, okay, that's it. I think we pushed it down far enough. And this volume represents them taking the other side and liquidating those contracts. Then you'll see the open interest fall. So you have to watch the volume. You have to watch the open interest. There's no real way to know. When we look at Ted Butler, we'll see that he explains there's no certain way to know this. So let's go over and look at the Ted Butler article because we're going to talk about the fact that markets are derivative driven and what that means and how that makes markets imbalanced. So this is, I just picked one. Now to summarize, Ted Butler has explained that when a market becomes derivative driven, in other words, the underlying commodity in the market is not what is setting the price, but a derivative of that underlying commodity is what's actually setting the price. Then you begin to enter in that area of where you have corrupt markets. So let's read this. You have to sit back and try to drill down to the cause of what's going on. Now, the actions by the Bank of Japan and the actions of our own central bank have basically been to inflate all investment assets such as bonds, stocks, and real estate. And the ironic thing is that in the past, whenever we've gone through this asset inflation mode, gold and silver and a variety of commodities have always participated. It stands out that this time, that contrary to the movement of all other assets, that gold and silver have been particularly weak. The only explanation for why this is is so is that we've developed not just in gold and silver but in all comex and nymex metals copper aluminum platinum palladium gold and silver even items like crude oil and even into the grains we've developed a mechanism that's so distorted it's like we're allowing the inmates to run the asylum now that's very important because you have to understand that in commodities markets you have derivatives, but you, you can, if you get into a situation and Ted Butler has cited the regulations, he's filed multiple lawsuits, and of course all the lawsuits have been dismissed, but regulators like the CFTC are tasked with making sure that, I will use the term, that the tail is not wagging the dog. The commodity, whether it be silver or gold or copper or platinum or palladium, that's the dog and the tail is the derivatives. Now, if we ever get into a situation where the tail 
is wagging the dog, then we've gotten into a situation, one, where markets are, are, the paper markets are no longer indicative of the true value of the commodity. And two, we've entered into an area where the regulators are required to act based upon their own regulations. So let's continue. In other words, if you're looking for the specific cause for why gold and silver have been particularly weak over the last couple of days or over another time period, you can trace it directly to the derivatives market, specifically the COMEX. There is such a large volume, and it's not just trading volume, it's positioning. The positioning is so extreme in these markets and at such large scale that it actually becomes the tail that wags the dog. I didn't read that before this. It just uh, something I came up with too. So that tells you how we're thinking. We should remember that derivatives, which futures contracts on gold and silver traded on the comics are classified as, are supposed to be derived from the real supply and demand fundamentals of any commodity. And that's supposed to kind of follow what develops developments there are in the real world of supply and demand. That's been distorted. That's no longer the case. So that's a great explanation of what I'm talking about, where the tail is wagging the dog. Now, I've shown you, and we've had massive attacks on the YouTube channel where people are saying, well, why can't the algos trade this back and forth? Because that's the tail wagging the dog. I tried to point out how buying volume of just 2 million physical ounces shut the mint down. Yet we're talking about billions and tens and hundreds of billions of paper silver being traded. So I wanted to come up with an analogy that would make this clearer. So I chose this stock. This is Overstock.com. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this company, Overstock.com, which as a CEO, Patrick Byrne, is one of the companies that has tried to fight naked shorting in the stock market. So I'm going to use this company as an example of what we're talking about with the tail wagging the dog. So if you can imagine, and this is not the case in the stock market, but if you can imagine it being the case, let's talk about this stock. So this is a stock that has a float of 14.97 million shares and outstanding 24 million shares. Uh, those are held by insiders, etc. Let's just look at a round number of 15 million shares. So we're going to say that we've got a company that's got 15 million shares out there. It's trading at about 24 bucks a share. So we've got a market cap of about $600 million, we'll say. Now, Let's imagine that we have a derivative on this, and I'm not talking about options because options are the ability to take delivery of the stock at a certain price at a certain time based upon if you're right, you can either cash it out. But I'm, I'm talking about let's theorize an analogy with stocks that's something similar to what's going on in silver. So if you can imagine you've got about a 15 million share float here in overstock.com. Now imagine that someone created a mechanism. You could imagine, say, the mechanism was like some hybrid mutual fund where the regulators allowed this fund to trade shares of overstock.com. Now they don't actually have the shares of the company. We only have 15 million shares of the company. But because the regulators allow it, they allow this derivative fund, we'll just call it the Overstock Paper Fund, to trade shares of the company. And occasionally, maybe 1% or a half a percent or a tenth of a percent of the time, they actually take delivery and cross that and arbitrage that to the real market. Now, imagine a situation where you had, say, 100 to 1 or 1,000 to 1 or 10,000 to one, because these are the numbers we're talking about in silver. So imagine you had some secondary derivative traded by some company like JP Morgan that was trading these imaginary shares of overstock.com. They don't have the shares, but they have a derivative based on the shares and they can occasionally take delivery of the shares. 
and it turns out that we end up with something like a hundred or a thousand times the volume of the actual float of the stock. So you can imagine a scenario where you had incredible volumes and whoever had the power to create these derivative shares and because the regulators allowed it, you, you could imagine a scenario where these people that can counterfeit these shares essentially could sell the value of this company down to pennies or they could drive the price of this company to infinity. Because if they're never forced to square away the vast majority of those shares to the real shares that are outstanding, then they can put the price wherever they want. Now, we don't actually have that with stocks. We have options and we have the DTCC, which is bad. And that's what Patrick Byrne was fighting against with his company. But if we had something on the order of silver with one of these stocks, you would have something like 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 times the number of shares traded on a derivative market for every one of the real shares. Now, what would happen with that? Well, if you imagine that you had somebody who had the real share of the company and they held that paper share and this went on and they drove the price either to the moon or down to nearly nothing, as long as the company was a real company and had real value, then they've really lost nothing only if they sell at a loss. But you can imagine the wild swings that we would have in the price of that stock just because 99 or 99.9 .9 or 99.99% .99 of the price action in this particular stock was not determined by share owners of the stock, but was determined by derivative owners who are people who never had to take delivery, buy the stock or do anything like that. So there's an example of why you can't let the tail wag the dog. It's not allowed in the stock market. It's only allowed to a certain extent. And again, I've covered the DTCC where we have the failures to deliver, but it's nothing like the percentage that we have in silver. We have hundreds to thousands to ten thousands to the number that I did recently with the uh, Silver Eagles, as much as 200,000 to one of paper ounces trading for every physical ounce. Now that is a situation where the tail is wagging the dog. And that means you have a derivatives driven market and the price is not being determined by the real commodity. The price is being determined by the manipulators. And we'll talk to you next time.